Well, hello everyone. Now today I want to try something a little bit crazy. I want to see, just for the sake of experimenting, if I can remove heat from my bedroom at a rate of 120,000 BTUs an hour. Or in other words, I want to have a 10-ton air conditioner in my bedroom. I know a lot of people would say that this is probably impossible. After all, most normal sized homes get by with a 2-ton air conditioner to cool the entire house. But this won't be done with a conventional air conditioner. It won't be done with a vapor compression cycle. Now, if you remember a while back, I did a video experimenting with using ice to provide air conditioning. So in this one, we're going to use a similar setup, except this time, everything's going to be jumbo sized. Now, before we can begin to experiment, we, we need to make a plan if we're going to reach our goal or get anywhere near it. So 120,000 BTUs an hour is equal to about a power of 35 kilowatts. Now, 10 tons of ice can hold a total of 2,880,000 BTUs. So at a steady rate of 120,000 BTUs an hour, it will melt, 10 tons of ice will melt in about 24 hours. And my ice box only holds about 200 pounds of ice, so in total it should be able to absorb 28,800 BTUs. So we need a steady flow rate of about 2,000 BTUs per minute. Now at that rate, the ice in the ice box should all melt in about 14 minutes. So in order to achieve this kind of heat flow rate, we're going to need a fairly large radiator and we're going to need a water pump with a high flow rate. Alright, so this is the radiator that we plan on using. And this is the water pump that we plan on using. So I expect that the water is going to enter the radiator at about 34 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's about 1.1 degrees Celsius. Now once the water gets inside the radiator, it's going to absorb heat and increase in temperature. And that's because we're going to be using the sensible heat of the water. Now sensible heat is the addition or removal of heat from any substance that causes a change in temperature but not a change in the state of matter. Now for example, if we were to take water and heat it from 50 degrees Fahrenheit to 68 degrees Fahrenheit, that's from 10 to 20 Celsius, we'll see an increase in temperature However, it will remain a liquid the entire time. It's not going to change to steam or ice. It's just going to remain a liquid. Now, regular vapor compression air conditioning doesn't work that way, but that will be for another video. Now, obviously, a greater difference in temperature means a greater flow of heat. However, that's also going to limit the ability of the radiator to absorb heat. All right, so this is the inlet to the radiator, and that other hose there is the outlet. So like I said, if the water is going to enter at 34 degrees Fahrenheit here, it needs to exit at a higher temperature over there. Now if it doesn't, we know that there wasn't any heat absorbed. So higher exiting temperatures of the water obviously indicate greater flow of heat into the radiator. However, higher exiting temperatures also limit the capacity of the radiator since there will be a thermal gradient across the radiator. So in other words, if there's a thermal gradient, it's going to be colder on this section of the radiator on this side because that's where the cold water is coming in. But over on that side of the radiator, it's going to be a little bit warmer. The section closest to the outlet that's going to be warmer. But that's important because just as the water needs to experience a change in temperature, so does the air flowing across the radiator. So if the room temperature is like 68, not 68, 86 degrees, sorry, for example, and the temperature of the radiator is 68 degrees, so if it's 30 Celsius in the room and it's 20 Celsius across the radiator, then there's going to be, there is a temperature difference, so there is obviously still going to be heat flowing. There's going to be cooling effect done, but the cooling effect would be greater if the radiator were a lower temperature. So if the radiator was all one degree Celsius, there'd be a lot more heat flowing into it. But obviously, like I said, not, not the entire radiator is going to be one degree Celsius. It's going to be colder here. It's going to be warmer over there. So that's one factor that's going to limit how much heat can flow into it. So the next thing to consider is the flow rate of the water pump. So it's important to get as much flow of water flowing through the radiator as possible. So that way, most of the radiator will be cold, like we said before. Otherwise, if the water's flowing too slow, there will be a thermal gradient, and one part will be cold, and one part will be really hot. Now, the sensible heat of water is 1 BTU per pound per degree Fahrenheit. So if we want 2,000 BTUs per minute, we could flow 2,000 pounds per minute 
or 250 gallons per minute at a temperature difference of one degree across the radiator. But it's unlikely that we're going to achieve a flow rate that high. So we need to increase the temperature difference across the radiator. And yeah, that is going to put a thermal gradient across it, but we really don't have any choice. So a more reasonable figure is about 25 gallons per minute and a temperature difference of 10 degrees Fahrenheit across the radiator. And that's going to help us achieve our goal of 2,000 BTUs per minute. Now, in order for this to happen, we need to have the water entering over here on this side at 34 degrees Fahrenheit, and we need it to exit over here at 44 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, yeah, that is going to put a thermal gradient on it, and it will limit how much heat that the radiator can absorb. So, obviously, in order for this to work, the air entering the radiator is going to have to be above 44 degrees Fahrenheit. But... I think that probably shouldn't be too hard to achieve. Obviously we also need a blower to move air across the radiator. And like I said with the water, now it's important that the blower actually moves enough air across the radiator in order for this to happen. So if it doesn't move enough air across the radiator, then we won't get the temperature difference between the in and the out. And we need. Now this blower can move 4,000 cubic feet a minute, but I don't know if it'll do that with the radiator blocking it. So with it uncovered, it'll do it, but with it covered, I don't know. But ideally, we want at least 4,000 cubic feet a minute, if not more, moving over the radiator. So now that we have a plan of action together, now we can start experimenting. So I'm going to start up the pump and the blower, and we're going to observe the temperature change in my room. Now this isn't the final project, it's not complete yet, we're not done with this, so this is just kind of a, just an initial experiment, just to see what happens. But before we're through with it, I want to get a fan shroud going from this blower over here to the radiator so we get more tight seals, so we can get more air flowing through the radiator. So anyways, it's enough talking for now, let's see if this thing works. Alright guys, the pump has started, blower for the radiator has started. As I said, we're not at full water flow rate, we're not at full air flow. This is just an initial test, and so far the results look pretty good. Reading a temperature here of about 45 degrees, that's the air coming out of the radiator, let me show you. There's the uh, bulb for the thermometer there. Looks like about 7 Celsius, I'll have to recheck this, but as you can see the temperature is falling. So the temperature in the room is about 72 degrees Fahrenheit, that's about 22 Celsius. So, it's actually looking pretty good. It feels quite cold in here actually right now, but let's go check the water pump. Alright, so this is the uh, flow meter coming out of the water pump. And the scale is in gallons per minute, so we're safely above 10 gallons per minute, but I do not think that we're getting the 25 gallons per minute that we need. So I'm going to have to get a flow meter with a higher scale here. But at least we know we can calculate for 10 gallons a minute. We'll measure the temperature difference between the water inlet and the water coming back from the radiator. Alright, so to measure the inlet water temperature, I'm just going to measure the temperature of the water that's in the ice box. I don't know if you guys were able to see it on camera, so I'll, I'll read it back to you.
Yeah, so it's reading about 36 Fahrenheit. Let's see, it's about 2.3 Celsius. So now I'm going to measure the uh, temperature that's coming back from the radiator. I'm trying not to make a huge mess do this, doing this. Let's see. Alright, so I went and turned the fan up, upstairs, up as high as it'll go. So we should be able to get a little higher return temperature here. So it's uh, reading 41 and a half. It's holding there pretty steady. It's about five and a half Celsius. So for an initial test run, that's not too bad. I was afraid that was going to happen with an air velocity that high. It just spit out all the condensation that came out of the radiator and it went everywhere. But hey, that's why I got this blanket down on the floor. It's meant for things like this. So we are going to have to make a fan shroud and some kind of condensate pan or some way to trap all that condensate and get it drained out. The humidity is really high today. It's the radiator and all the tubing and everything sweating like crazy. But it did work really well. In fact, in the few minutes that we were down there, it's already dropped from 72 to 68 in this room. I'm just checking the thermometer. It's 68, but yeah, so far so good. I'll calculate the uh, flow rate of the heat and I'll update the video. Alright, so that wasn't too bad for an initial test. I'll put the final figures up here, but just to tell you, I think we got around 2 tons, around about 24,000 BTUs an hour, so that's not too bad. So I ran the system and ran it until pretty much all the ice melted out, and we got down to a temperature of 52 degrees Fahrenheit in my bedroom, which it was pretty cold. But anyways, we're not done. I do want to get the number up to 10 tons, but we're going to need a flow meter that can measure all the way up to 25 gallons per minute, which is what we need. And I think we might need a higher temperature in the room, so I want to wait until it gets really hot, like maybe 90 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere around 30 Celsius. So anyways, guys, I thank you for watching, and if you do have any questions about this crazy project or any of the other ones you see here, feel free to email, message, and comment, and whatever. Thanks, guys.